Anyang Haseo. Ah. I'm Jane Harmon, uh, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center and a lover of Korea, as many of you know. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. This is the fourth Kyung Nam Wilson Center Washington Forum on Korea. Uh, I think I've been to three, three, at least three. Uh, our partnership with Kyung Nam University is close and dear and is a foundation for much of the strong programming we do here on Korean issues. And in case you don't know these people, um, Christian Osterman, I, who doesn't know him, he's Korean. He looks, he's, he speaks German, but he's really Korean, uh, is the director of our history and public policy program and our global Europe program has had a huge amount to do with Korea. And James Person, what happened to James? Right there, who has the most glorious wedding photo to his Korean wife, uh, is the one who really uh, does uh, much of the work on behalf of uh, our Korea program, and I just want to give them both a shout out. Also like to recognize, in particular, uh, my dear friend, Ambassador Sun, right there, who is the chair professor at Kyung Nam University. Uh, he was there when President Park, not the head of Korea, pr the President Park head of Kyung Nam University, uh, awarded me an honorary degree in 2012. It was a huge deal. I was enormously um, personally touched by the gesture. And uh, the university went all out. And I have worn those robes ever since when I've appeared at US universities. So just to make a point, I received an honorary degree in the United States before that at Smith College, which I attended. But my second honorary degree is from Kyung Nam University and my outfit, my graduating outfit, is from uh, Kyung Nam University. Uh, the Wilson Center has a long tradition of deep, thoughtful work on Korea. Everybody here knows that. Since the early 1990s, our history and public policy program has been at the forefront of efforts bringing new archival mis materials to light. Korea's past, informing the nation's remarkable present. I particularly like to encourage you all to visit the center's modern history, modern Korean history portal, uh, a really peerless online resource. There's a lot there to challenge conventional wisdom and old assumptions. Across the board, Korea is deeply embedded in the work of the Wilson Center programs. Our Asia program, of course, provides a key forum to discuss contemporary issues in US-Korea relations, but our engagement is broader. For one, our Urban Sustainability Lab, I'm looking at Blair Rubel, who uh, has had many jobs at the Wilson Center, but now is our vaunted uh, Vice President for Programs, uh, our urban and, and uh, the key driver of the, this uh, Urban Sustainability Lab, now partners with the Korean Land and Housing Corporation and the Korean Research Institute for Human Settlements. And early next year, we're happy to say, We'll be building on the center's capacity in this area with the establishment of a center for Korean history and public policy. So, something to look forward to. I'd like to take a moment to thank the Korea Foundation. I'm looking at my friend Xi'an. Welcome to Washington. Hello, how are you? Good, okay. Uh, for all their support over the years, as well as Korean Air, check out this airplane. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a representative of Korean Air here, but the airplane was dropped off this morning, and all of us are using uh, this enormously generous gift of tickets that have brought our participants from uh, uh, Korea to the forum today. And uh, We call Korean Air the official international airline of the Wilson Center. Cool, huh? So, it's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Ambassador Robert King, Bob King the Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues. Ambassador King was confirmed as Special Envoy in November 2009, um, but I remember him before that. Uh, for 24 years, he served as Chief of Staff to Congressman Tom Lantos. I don't think anybody here uh, uh, fails to remember with great fondness Tom Lantos. He was uh, a congressman from California. He was my colleague in the Congress for many years. I also represented a district in California. And he was uh, 
uh, chairman of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee for many of those years, and uh, sing a singular voice for human rights. I think nobody ever, before or since, has carried that banner more fiercely than Tom Lantos. Ambassador King also holds a PhD in international relations from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, a place we know well and do a lot of work with. His talk today is a timely one given the recent passage in the UN General Assembly of a draft resolution uh, that uh, would, um, uh, there's a typo here, there's a word missing, but it's something about North Korea, would refer uh, North Korea. Hmm, James, wasn't James, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. W that would North Korea, refer North Korea to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. Very serious job, uh, charge, and a, a very serious matter. I visited, I actually visited Pyongyang, Pyongyang, Pyong, uh, in my former life as a member of Congress. I was astonished then and remain astonished by the lengths to which the regime will go in, in suppressing dissent and the exercise of basic freedoms. We're grateful to have Ambassador King here today to address this topic, and please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, Jane Harmon was one of the figures on Capitol Hill that we all looked up to as uh, someone who said what she thought and uh, had good thoughts to say. And uh, it's been a real coup for the Wilson Center to have her here. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, it's been a real coup for the Wilson Center to have her here as the head of the programs here. Uh, this is the time of year that uh, journalists like uh, uh, Jane Lee uh, write end of year stories. It's a good time. You want something that's going to fill the newspaper when you don't have time to write another story. Uh, you want something that will last for a while so when Christmas comes you don't have to run into the office to, to deal with something. What I'd like to do today is do a, an end of year story in terms of talking about North Korea human rights and talk about what's been going on over the last year with regard to North Korea. And quite frankly, this has been a remarkable year in terms of human rights in North Korea. We've made progress that I think few of us thought we'd be able to do, and it's all come about largely in the last uh, year. In February, the Commission of Inquiry, established by the UN Human Rights Council, issued its report uh, on human rights conditions in North Korea. This was held, was done after the commission held groundbreaking public hearings in Seoul, Tokyo, London, Washington, and a number of other places uh, where they heard testimony from uh, North Koreans who left North Korea, refugees who talked about their experience there, specialists and experts. I know a number of you here were involved in testifying before the commission and were involved in that. <coughs> These were made public, these were included on the website, uh, the video is available, the written testimony is available in a variety of languages. The commission concluded that systematic, widespread, and gross human rights violations have been and are being committed in North Korea. And according to the commission, some of these abuses may meet the high threshold required for proof of crimes against humanity under international law. Indeed, the commission made a very compelling case that these violations of human rights have taken place and are continuing to take place. In March, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a strongly worded resolution introduced by Japan and the European Union commending the commission, stressing the importance of holding uh, North Korea accountable and uh, this resolution was approved in the 47-member Human Rights Council with 30 yay votes, 6 nays, and 11 abstentions. In April, the UN Security Council in New York held an ARIA formula meeting at which North Korea human rights issues were discussed. The three members of the, of the Commission of Inquiry spoke. Uh, there were two 
uh, North Korean refugees who spoke about their experience. It was the first time that the Security Council took up the issue of North Korea human rights. Uh, many of you were there for it. It was an amazing event to see that happen. In May, North Korea had its second universal periodic review at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. This is a process that all members of the UN go through. Each country makes a presentation to the Human Rights Council, talks about its human rights situation, progress, difficulties, and then here's reactions and responses from the other members of the Human Rights Council and other, other members of the United Nations. <coughs> this occurs about every five years, and this was the second time that North Korea went through the process. Uh, that included uh, adoption of the final report on DPRK. The thing that was most interesting in terms of this process is that North Korea basically followed the rules. The first time around, they kind of did their own thing. This time around, they followed the rules for the UPR process. They accepted some of the recommendations. Uh, they uh, recognized that they had made progress in certain areas, and they talked about what they'd done in terms of disability rights. But the fact that the North Koreans participated in the way they participated, I think, the most important element is that they legitimized the idea that human rights are indeed a concern of the international community and that the international community does have an interest, a legitimate interest, in what goes on in individual countries where human rights are violated. So this was, I think, a, a very useful exercise in terms of what happened. In June, uh, in Geneva, Special Rapporteur on North Korea Human Rights Issues, Marzuki Darisman, presented his report. Um, in September, we had the final report on the Universal Periodic Review. In September, we also had in New York a side event, again, which many of you attended, at which Secretary of State John Kerry, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Zaid, who uh, had only been appointed two weeks before that. Uh, the foreign ministers of Japan and South Korea were there, and the North Korean human rights issue was discussed in a very highly visible, uh, highly publicized event calling on North Korea to make progress on its human rights situation. In October, the Third Committee of the General Assembly had a session at which Marzuki Darisman presented his report. Uh, the committee uh, examined the issues and uh, drafted a resolution which called on the Security Council to take up the issue and to consider referring the issue of North Korea's human rights violations to the International Criminal Court. Uh, this resolution was a highly controversial resolution because of the referral to the criminal court, and the North Koreans were extremely concerned about what happened in terms of that uh, situation. Uh, the Results of the vote in the third committee were interesting. Uh, the North Korean news agency said, quote, the U.S. barely managed to garner votes necessary for adopting the resolution by whipping together hand-raising machines. I love this North Korean rhetoric. But not a few countries profess that they voted for it under the threat that the U.S. and Japan will halt economic aid, not because it's human rights issue. This clearly proves the resolution was a political fraud. Well, we barely managed to garner the votes. The final vote was 111 votes for the resolution, 19 votes against the resolution, and 55 abstentions. When you look at the list of those countries that voted against the resolution and in support of North Korea, you have a pretty good list of the rogues gallery of human rights violators. Uh, states such as Cuba, Vietnam, China, Russia, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Bolivia, Iran, Syria, Belarus. And when you look at the countries, the 111 that voted for it, you have the other side of the spectrum on the human rights issues. But I think this vote has been uh, quite amazing in terms of what is happening. Uh, there are still a couple of things yet to happen this year in terms of, of this situation. There will be a final vote in the full General Assembly. The same countries will be voting in the General Assembly as voted in the third committee. But the final vote will take place, I think, the week after next, uh, tentatively set for the 18th of December. 
The other thing that has happened, uh, and it uh, happened just today, uh, 10 countries, members of the Security Council, signed a letter that was presented to the President of the Council calling on the Council to take up the issue of North Korea human rights. This was a letter that was sponsored by Australia, the United States, uh, South Korea, uh, as well as uh, a number of the other countries that one would expect on the Security Council have proposed that this be taken up. The Security Council operates in a fashion that uh, if nine members request an item be placed on the agenda, it uh, has sufficient support clearly and it's put on the agenda. Uh, adding an item to the agenda does not allow an opportunity for a veto from any of the permanent members, so this basically will see that the North Korea human rights issue is put on the agenda of the Security Council. Uh, there may be a discussion in the Security Council uh, later this month, or certainly uh, uh, if it doesn't happen later this month, it will happen next year. So I think this is an encouraging sign in terms of what's happened. As I said, what's happened this year is something that I think none of us expected when we started out a year ago. Uh, one of the best indications of the significance of what's happened is the impact that this has had in North Korea. Uh, in the first half of 2014, North Korea took the position they've sort of generally taken on human rights. Uh, they've uh, said quietly, uh, occasionally there were uh, press releases but uh, indicating that, uh, you know, this is a, a U.S. effort, uh, hostile U.S. policy, and that that's all it represents. Uh, the last half of the year, when it, after we'd gone through the Commission of Inquiry, as we were going through the uh, uh, Universal Periodic Review, and particularly as we moved into September, as things moved to New York, the North Koreans became much more aggressive and active in terms of being involved on the human rights issue. The North Koreans issued a report on the United States and its human rights violations. They issued a similar report at the same time on South Korea and its human rights violations, presented them to the officials of the United Nations and requi requested they be circulated as UN documents. They're fun reading when you feel like you would like to take a look at what the North Koreans say. Uh, but the North Koreans were involved. They were engaged. The other thing that's been interesting, for the first time in 15 years, North Korea's foreign minister attended the General Assembly high-level session. First time in 15 years that we had a North Korean uh, foreign minister there. Uh, the other thing uh, that has been interesting to see uh, is the increasing number of statements issued by the North Koreans on human rights. As I say, North Koreans would issue a statement periodically in the past. Now they are issuing them almost daily in terms of uh, denunciations. I, I'm sorry, I wander away from this microphone here. Uh, th they're uh, issuing denunciations uh, frequently, uh, and uh, they are issuing strongly worded statements about the United States, uh, as well as uh, denouncing us uh, for the kind of things that we've done. But the other thing they've done in terms of engaging is that for the first time, North Korean diplomats have been making appearances at places like the Council on Foreign Relations. In the past, this was not something that North Korean diplomats did. There have been a couple occasions this year where they have been involved in Council on Foreign Relations events in the last couple of months. They also sent out diplomats uh, not only the foreign minister, who's been much more active than the previous foreign minister had been, Kang suk Ju, who is a very senior uh, foreign policy official in North Korea, visited Europe, uh, had meetings in Switzerland, in Germany, and in Brussels. In Brussels, uh, after his visit, the North Koreans indicated an interest in establishing diplomatic relations with uh, the European Union. Uh, he indicated, while he was in Brussels, an interest in resuming the political and human rights dialogue that the EU had with North Korea had been uh, stopped uh, over a decade ago. So that uh, this, I think, reflects a definite sense of engagement on the part of the North Koreans that they feel like they need to be involved. Uh, the North Koreans, unlike their activities in the past, presented a draft 
at the third committee of a resolution they would like to see as opposed to the resolution that was drafted by the European Union and the Japanese uh, in which uh, reference to uh, referring the issue to the International Criminal Court uh, certainly was not found and uh, there were a number of efforts to try to push that resolution. It didn't get very far and Cuba uh, almost certainly in consultation with the DPRK uh, issued uh, proposed a series of uh, amendments to the draft resolution, including removing reference to uh, accountability, so that we've had uh, a definite indication that North Korea has felt the pressure that has come out during the last year. Uh, the question that we now are looking at as we look at what's happened this last year is what do we do next year? Uh, where do we go from here? And I think those are questions that I don't think we've got the full answers to, but I think it's something we need to think about. Where do we go from here to continue the pressure to make progress to move forward on human rights in North Korea? Uh, as I mentioned, the final vote uh, in the General Assembly will take place uh, in a week and a half. <coughs> there will be a session in the Security Council that will probably deal with this fairly soon. <laughs> the other issue that is coming up uh, also relates uh, to what the UN has done on these issues. Uh, the uh, Commission of Inquiry recommended the establishment of a field, base, uh, a field office uh, to continue research and gathering information that might be relevant to human rights violations in North Korea. After some consideration and discussion, the decision was made that uh, Seoul would be the best location for that office. The South Korean government has graciously agreed that uh, it would host the office, and the uh, UN Human Rights, uh, uh, High Commission for Human Rights will open the office in Seoul in a couple of months. There will be a number of people that will be assigned to staff at their responsibility will be to continue the work that the commission has been doing in terms of gathering information on North Korean human rights violations. We continue the same cycle uh, next year that we had this year. There'll be uh, discussion in the Human Rights Council in March. There'll be discussion in the uh, General Assembly of Third Committee in, in October. But there are other things that we probably need to do, and that is we need to think about how do we continue to push forward on these issues. And this, I think, is, is something that I'm hopeful that uh, might come out in terms of your discussions today as you talk about North Korea and, and what's happening on the peninsula. What are the things that we need to do to continue the momentum, to continue the pressure, to continue making progress on human rights in North Korea, what are the next steps that we need to follow? We're not announcing anything today. We'd be interested in hearing what your views and thoughts are in terms of how we move forward in terms of these kind of things. One of the things that we have tried to do is in addition to pressing the North Koreans on human rights, is we've also tried to engage the North Koreans to the extent that we can do that. They are not engageable very much for the United States at this point. There are a number of American NGOs that have had some success in terms of working in North Korea, and we've tried to encourage that kind of activity. Uh, as I say, there are a number of American NGOs. I know there are a number of South Korean NGOs that have had some activity in North Korea. There are some from other countries. And these kind of things, I think, are an important part of what we need to do in terms of encouraging North Korea to be open and more engaged and more involved with the world and make sure that information is available to them about what's happening in the world. One of the things that's made that difficult in the last little while uh, is uh, the Ebola quarantine that's been established by the North Korean government. If you want to go to North Korea these days, you spend 21 days in quarantine before you're able to have meetings and move about normally. Three of the NGOs who've been involved in activities in North Korea have canceled visits uh, during the month of November because of this 21-day requirement. One of the NGOs tried to arrange to have North Koreans come to Beijing so they could have discussions, uh, and the North Koreans said, no, we can't, because if we go out, we'll be under quarantine for 21 days. So uh, this is not a, an easy time to engage the North Koreans, but it's one that I think we need to uh, to try to, to look at and, and move forward. The one bright spot with the quarantine 
is that it probably means there'll be fewer American citizens traveling to North Korea, and that may be helpful. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts and ideas in terms of where we go from here and how we move forward. It's been an extremely successful year in terms of creating pressure and creating forward movement on human rights in North Korea, but I think it's extremely important that we continue to devise ways of, of continuing the progress and continuing the momentum. Thank you very much for what you do and what you contribute. The ideas and thoughts that come out of conferences like this are extremely important in terms of informing what we do uh, as we try to deal with some of these intractable issues. Thank you very much for the opportunity of speaking to you today. Ambassador King has, has uh, kindly agreed to uh, take some questions and to hear your, your, your thoughts as well. Um, I ask you to just wait for a mic and to please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jenny Park with the USA Journal. Uh, North Korean uh, uh, human rights uh, issue is the uh, and resolution of the UN um, the Security Council, but uh, China and Russia's veto power it is unlikely to uh, refer to uh, the, the take to uh, ICC in North Korean uh, human rights issues. What is the uh, U.S. have that uh, uh, diplomatic uh, power to affect that the Russia and China? Thank you very much. Um. We continue to raise the issue of North Korea human rights with, uh, with many countries, including China and including Russia, and we'll continue to raise those issues with them. In terms of what we do in the Security Council, uh, we don't cross bridges until we come to them. And uh, when we come to the point where we have an issue to decide, we'll, we'll make the decision. And we haven't resolved any of the issues on that right now. Thank you. I'm Chad O'Carroll from NK News. I'm just wondering if this push on human rights, um, do you think engagement will be possible next year? There are already signs in the EU, for example, that uh, the critical engagement policy is really in trouble now. Um, after the uh, push at the General Assembly, meetings I was invited to with uh, DPRK ministers were abruptly cancelled. Um, I'm just wondering, do you think in the future that engagement is really going to work? Uh, given the context of the year ahead? Um, there's, there's merit and value in, in engagement, and uh, I think there will be organizations uh, in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere that will push for, uh, for, for engagement. Uh, I would hope the North Koreans would see the value of this kind of thing and, and would uh, continue to do so. Uh, and uh, we certainly have encouraged uh, American NGOs and others. We've tried to engage the North Koreans ourselves with little success in the last uh, year or so, but uh, yeah, I think it's useful, it's important, and uh, I hope others will continue to do that. Katie Lee from KBS. Uh, uh, Mr. King, do you have a plan to visit North Korea, or did you request any proposal to visit North Korea to North Korean officials, so uh, you can meet them in New York. By uh, some report, they want to meet uh, you. But I've, uh, I've tried a couple of fine. times to go to North Korea when we had American citizens there, and the North Koreans invited me and then disinvited me before I could get there. Uh, at this point, I don't have any plans to go to North Korea. I'm not sure whether the North Koreans would invite me. Uh, but uh, you know, at this point, I don't have any plans to visit North Korea. Are there some people who have some ideas they want to share rather than questions? And, and we love the press, but let's get some questions from some of these people who think about these issues that have some ideas for, for us that they'd like to share.
recently North Korea is, ve is very, very sensitive to the, uh, with regard to the uh, releasing uh, American field, the interview, uh, which is, <coughs> uh, the whose, uh, of which the story is about the uh, assess assassination of North Korean leader uh, by CIA agents. Uh, but North Koreans are very, very sensitive to that issue and, and have requested uh, uh, the United States to, to uh, take some measures to not to release that film. What is your response of the United States government to that request? Is it appropriate and legitimate that North Korea uh, raise that uh, such uh, issues and problems? Uh, we don't tell American movie makers how to make their movies. Uh, there are a lot of movies I've seen that I think probably would have been better m unmade, uh, but, but we don't tell them that. We're in a society where people who want to show movies and want to create movies do so. Uh, the one thing that the North Koreans have done is generated sufficient interest that what probably would have been a movie that had some attention for 20 to 30 year old males uh, will now be released on Christmas Day rather than released in mid-September. Uh, and it will probably be a blockbuster when it comes out thanks to the North Korean, uh, what the North Koreans have done by calling attention to it. So if they were trying to discourage people from seeing the movie, they did the exact wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> but as I say, we don't tell movie makers what they should make or not make. <laughs> Uh, I haven't bought a ticket, no. <laughs> and, and Christmas is still a couple of, uh, and I'm certainly not going to be there on Christmas Day. I'd rather do other things on Christmas Day. Uh. Uh, there, there's been uh, a historic reluctance in the U.S. policy uh, to uh, link human rights issues to other issues regarding uh, the DPRK. And uh, I've always thought, well, um, the uh, the downside of linkage would be that you uh, f you sacrifice any advantage you might gain on the other ends of it. But uh, what um, what's your thinking on uh, having a full court press on linking uh, all uh, issues related to the DPRK with human rights and uh, uh, attempting to attain some leverage and progress on? on that score? I think generally what we've tried to do in terms of policy, both to North Korea and other countries as well, is to push ahead on human rights issues when there are human rights problems with North Korea or other countries. But at the same time, there are other issues and, and generally, in some cases we link them, in most cases we don't. In the case of North Korea, we have a major issue with uh, nuclear weapons. And that's a big issue for us. That is a fundamental issue for us. And I don't see us linking uh, denuclearization and human rights and, and that kind of thing. Uh, I think we've got to move forward uh, in terms of making progress on uh, the nuclear issue, but I think we also need to move forward on human rights. Doesn't answer your question, but I think the, <laughs> the difficulty of linking is I'm still looking for solutions. <laughs> Hi, I'm Young Hun Song uh, from the uh, Kinu, uh, South Korea. Uh, I think the uh, human the improvement of human rights uh, is is very highly associated with the development of democracy in a country. So what do you think the, the international community, community can do uh, to uh, promote democ democracy in North Korea? Uh, let me say, first of all, the research that Kinu does is particularly useful and particularly important. I've participated in a number of Kinu conferences. The reports that Kinu issues, issues are particularly important and useful in terms of understanding all aspects of, of North Korea. So I appreciate what the Kinu research does and, and how important it is. Um, 
Uh, there's no question that human rights is, is very much related to democracy. It, it's not just a question of, of uh, you know, rights of individuals. It's, it's related to rule of law. It's related to constitutional processes. And I think we need to, to urge North Korea to move in those directions. The countries that have been successful have moved in the direction of, of greater institutionalization of democracy and democratic values and rule of law and so forth. And, and countries uh, that have made progress in terms of their economies have to make progress on rule of law if they're going to be successful. And I think we, we need to make those linkages known to the North Koreans and to others. And uh, this is a, one of the values of, of some of the non-government organizations that work with, with North Koreans, is they tend to, to build respect and, uh, and support for those kind of ideas and values. And I think we need, to, we need to continue that effort, and I think we need to continue to support that effort, which we do. Thank you, Ambassador. Just one question about the, my name is Ken Dante. One question about the UN vote that you mentioned. What was the group that abstained? You mentioned there were about 50 countries that abstained. I wonder if there was any kind of grouping of those countries or what that was about. Where, where are you from? Uh, Non-affiliated. Oh, okay. Uh, in terms of, uh, of the 55 countries, most of these are countries which, uh, uh, for one reason or another, oppose the idea of individual country mandates. Uh, they think that human rights issues should deal with an issue, not with a specific country in terms of how it conducts its policy. And uh, of those who spoke against the resolution, those who uh, have spoken against the uh, special rapporteur on North Korea human rights, the reports that he's issued, are countries that argue we should not be singling out individual countries on human rights violations, that this should be a, a, a broader issue. We should be looking at uh, rights of the disabled. We should be looking at uh, rights for women. We should be looking at uh, rule of law issues and that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to categorize, there are 55 countries, I wouldn't want to categorize them as, as more than that. We have another person here. Introduce yourself. Uh, uh, hello, I'm Carrie Park from Georgetown University. And um, a recent uh, re like, uh, research report from Asa Institute suggested the uh, U.S. to adopt a more comprehensive uh, sanction against North Korea, including the human rights violations. But I felt those kind of um, like comprehensive like sanction might like raise the bar for lifting the sanction from North Korea and making like, uh, like behavior changes in North Korea more like, like ineffective because for North Korea, it would like they would feel that like removing the sanction is too hard if the human rights violation like provisions are included. And however, like this kind of things are being discussed in think tanks. So I was wondering, how do you think about like imp like imposing comprehensive comprehensive sanction against North Korea? Uh, I think that's a good suggestion. Maybe we got to look at at the, what that might do. Uh, I think it's probably something worth looking at as, as a way forward. I don't have any uh, suggestions in terms of how, what we ought to do or how we ought to do at this point, but I think that's an interesting idea. Hi, my name is Kang Sao uh, from uh, Free North Korea Freedom Coalition. And um, as, uh, as you mentioned, there are so many successful uh, success in terms, in terms of raising awareness in North Korean human rights that issue. Uh, I think that the core is the uh, braveness of the North Korean defectors who has, who has been able to uh, come up and um, testify what they've been, been through in, that, uh, in North Korean regime. So I just wondering whether you have any, any plan in terms of the uh, US government to support North Korean defector organizations or their works, or even bringing more North Korean defectors to uh, to US, because during the ten years of North Korean uh, Human Rights Act, we only have like 176 North Korean defectors coming uh, were allowed to come to US. So I am wondering whether you have more like uh, uh, aggressive uh, approach or um, uh, policy on North Korean defectors. Thank you. Now, the issue of the North Korean uh, defectors, the refugees from North Korea that find their way out, 
uh, is one of the most important issues that we deal with, and it, it is an issue of concern. These people are subjected to all kinds of, uh, of torture and pressure and other things. If they are caught and returned, they are punished. They are punished severely. Uh, I was in Hanawan, the uh, facility that the uh, South Korean government maintains for helping North Koreans uh, adjust to uh, life in South Korea just uh, three weeks ago. Had a very interesting conversation with four of the people who have just arrived uh, recently in Hanawan. Um, the, and, and the United States is very much supportive of these individuals uh, being able to get out of North Korea if they choose to leave North Korea. We raise the issue of North Korean refugees with the Chinese uh, pretty much every time we meet with the Chinese uh, to discuss human rights issues. And uh, this is an issue of concern for us. It's something we try to do. In terms of why have more North Koreans not chosen to come to the United States, 176 uh, in the 10 years since the, human right, the North Korean Human Rights Act was passed. During that same period, there are probably somewhere around uh, 100 times that many who went to South Korea. I think during the same 10 years, there were somewhere close to uh, 17,000 that made it to South Korea. Uh, it's not because it's that difficult to get into the United States. It is not easy to get into the United States. But when uh, a refugee is able to get out of, of China and, and somewhere where they can make a choice as to where they want to go, they will be granted citizenship in South Korea immediately. They can come to the United States, but it will take them five years to get American citizenship. They go to South Korea much quicker than they come to the United States. Uh, it takes a month or two at most once someone has left China before they're in South Korea. If they want to come to the United States, it takes six months to a year. This is not because we discriminate against North Koreans, but they do have to go through the same procedures that any other refugee has to go through to claim refugee asylum status in the United States. Uh, when you are sitting in an uncomfortable tropical holding cell, uh, the idea of being in South Korea in two months or being in the United States in six to 12 months makes it fairly hard to say, eh, let's go to the United States. When you come to the United States, you have to learn a new language. Uh, you've got less assistance because we provide the same assistance for South Koreans as we provide to refugees from other countries, but it does not reach the level of the assistance that the South Korean government provides to refugees from North Korea. The South Korean government is especially generous and helpful in helping these people come to uh, uh, adjust to life in, in South Korea. Uh, this is a choice that these refugees make individually. And as they make those choices, it's one of the first times in their life they really have had an opportunity to make a choice. We should not be trying to influence them, you know, eh, come on my side, come over here. Uh, no, it, it's a choice that they have to make, and I can understand why they choose to make the decisions they make. The one thing that I want to emphasize is that in dealing with these refugee issues, we work extremely closely with the South Korean government. We cooperate in places where refugees are found and where they're uh, detained before they're sent uh, forward. Uh, we are able to use our diplomatic clout in some cases to help those who want to go to South Korea. Uh, the South Koreans have been extremely generous in helping those refugees who want to come to the United States. So our, our cooperation with South Korea on this issue is very close. If more want to come to the United States, the opportunity will be there. Uh, but uh, it's a choice that they make. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Professor Sun from Gyeongnam University. Do you think um, the North Korea will go as they keep threatening? They go as far as um, conducting another round of nuclear test? Uh, because uh, the human rights pressure has um, uh, given them very good reason to go extreme. In that case, we may uh, lose. Uh, we, we will get more uh, loss than gain. 
It, it's a very serious question, and the North Koreans have specifically said if this resolution is adopted, uh, w there will be another nuclear test. Uh, my sense is that um, the North Koreans are going to test a nuclear weapon when they want to, when they have need to do it for technological reasons, or when they have reason to do it for broader political reasons. Uh, my guess is there's a lot of pressure on them not to test nuclear weapons. They don't have a lot of friends. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians have no interest in seeing the North Koreans uh, use nuclear weapons. The effect of North Korea's nuclear weapons has been to uh, maintain a strong U.S. military presence in that part of Asia. Uh, it has encouraged the Japanese to move towards bolstering their military forces. Those are not effects that either Russia or China are happy about. And so I don't think that Russia and China are going to say, yeah, go ahead and test if you want to. I, I think there are real problems about that. Uh, I think the North Koreans will threaten and uh, will use bluster to try to discourage us from moving forward on human rights issues. Uh, I think we need to move forward. Uh, and I think the North Koreans need to be very careful about what they decide to do. I'm Norman Newrider from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's nice to see you in person. It's good to see you in person, too, Norm. <laughs> the, um, you know, we've found that science, sort of neutral science, good things, environment and so on, is a pretty good instrument for some engagement with them. But there are some problems. One is that if you do anything, you have to find money to pay for it, and there are limitations on the number of people who are very interested in doing anything positive with them. The second thing is that if you try now to get money into North Korea to do something, you can't unless you carry it in your pocket. I'm not suggesting that I do, but uh, that's really a problem for Post, for instance. Yeah. And I, mean, I suppose you know about that, and I don't know whether you're doing anything about it. But you ask for suggestions. I honestly think if that climate for funding this sort of thing were a bit better. There's quite a number of things that could still be done in very neutral areas like reforestation, the environment, uh, some work around, some, uh, some work around uh, particular sites such as Pactu and so on. So anyway, that's, it's a modest suggestion, but I think it's one you might consider. Now, it's, it's a good suggestion, and I think the idea of cooperation in scientific areas makes a lot of sense. I think science is an area that we have to be especially careful of. Uh, we don't cooperation in uh, biotechnology or uh, nuclear physics, but it seems to me that there are a lot of other areas, as you mentioned, uh, reforestation, uh, possibly some things that, uh, that relate to volcanic activity where there might be opportunities for cooperation. And I think we ought to, to do that. I think n there's great merit in encouraging North Korean scientists and others to have contact with people outside their own country to see what's happening in the world outside North Korea. And I think this is the one thing that will produce uh, pressure on the government to move in a more positive direction, and so I think I'm, I'm very much supportive for what you're doing. I wasn't able to help you on seismograph, but I think we can help you on other things. <laughs> One final question? Or? Actually, I actually have a couple hands up, but uh, um, this thing. Hi, uh, I'm John Blaha from the National Committee on North Korea, and I'm also a graduate student at the Elliott School of International Affairs. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on perhaps engaging North Korea in a multilateral effort, uh, particularly involving a beacon nation of sorts, such as Mongolia, um, which you know has a 60-plus year history with, with North Korea and uh, has the benefit of having gone through the transition of a communist government to a, to a democratic one or maybe even Iran, uh, assuming that they have successful negotiations with uh, P5 plus one. Uh, with, with Iran, that's a big if, and, and you know we can see where things go. Uh, in terms of Mongolia, I'm uh, supportive of that effort. I think the Mongolians have played a very positive role in terms of dealing with North Korea. Uh, they have a relationship, they've provided assistance to North Korea, 
Uh, their president was there recently and made comments that were very positive in terms of uh, democratic development. So I think there probably is, is there are opportunities with regard to Mongolia that we should certainly try to take advantage of. Very good idea. Th Final word. Thank you very much. W appreciate what you're doing. I didn't hear a lot of ideas about where we go from here, so I hope this afternoon your conference will produce some, some ideas that you can pass on and help us. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your interest in North Korea. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador King, for taking the time to, to join us this afternoon. Uh, just to remind everyone, we begin at 1.45, um, just across the, the corridor in the auditorium. Um, so we hope you'll, you'll join us. We have two sessions, the first one on marketization and social change, North Korea. The second uh, session, which starts at 3, is looking at uh, uh, reporting on North Korea. So thank you very much.